I was 11 and a half when I got my first period. Perhaps the only girl in class who did. It was awful because I could not talk about it, either at home or at school. Apart from being told that it happened too soon, I was not given any other information. Of course, I had a lot of questions. For instance, do boys also get their period? Forget answering the question. I was in fact ridiculed for asking what I thought was a perfectly valid question. And that further drove me into a shell. So it was during this time when I could barely bring myself to talk about menstruation that I happened to stain my skirt in school one day during my period. I remember very clearly where I was sitting and that there was a boy sitting right behind me. All through the class, I hoped and prayed that the teacher would not call my name, requiring me to stand up and give the answer. And just as it happens in a very bad dream, I heard my name. I do not remember what happened next. How I stood up, what I said, what the teacher said, it was all a blur. What I do remember was that that moment on, I completely erased this boy from my mind. He did not exist. It never happened. Years later, as teenagers, he tried to get in touch with me. But I was so afraid that he would remember this incident and mention it to me that I never met him again. When I started to share my menstrual stories with adolescent girls across government schools, I realized that to be able to talk about that, which is your most difficult, most embarrassing, most troublesome memory of your past, is to truly feel liberated. The first time I said it, they smiled. The second time, they laughed. The third time, I learned to laugh with them. And then I was free. When I used to go to government schools in rural areas, I was quite taken aback by just how shy the girls actually were. All the preparation that I would do to talk about the biology and the hygienic practices would simply fall flat once I stood in front of the girls. When they got to know what I was about to tell them, they would immediately close the doors, the windows, and then their eyes and ears. It hit me then that no matter how knowledgeable I might be, it is of no use unless I can get the girls to open up and talk about menstruation. So to ease things up, I would begin every session with a very personal and intimate, embarrassing story of my first period. That's when the girls would realize that, hey, my story is just like her. And then they would start sharing their experiences. And soon there would be a classroom full of girls eager to show off how okay they are to talk about their period. That's how I learned that for many girls, the first time they bled, they actually thought they're going to die. There were girls who thought that they somehow managed to wound themselves there. And if they could just get hold of a bandit, it would all be okay. Then there were those girls who actually thought and felt that their mothers would be heartbroken if they found out about this new disease. So they never spoke about it, never used any absorbent material, and just bled until someone found out. Imagine how relieved they would have been to discover that they were not about to die. Perhaps they were so relieved that all the taboos, restrictions, and rituals that followed did not matter as much. At least they would be alive. It is important to talk about menstruation in order to handle the issues around menstruation. Last year, we released an animated video called My3, which covered the biology and all the hygienic aspects of menstruation. We did this so that as educators, we could focus on helping girls overcome their inhibitions. Only once they talk about their period, are they able to get comfortable around it. Then they take charge and find their own solutions. So there were some girls who found the courage to ask their mothers to buy sanitary napkins for them. There were other girls who felt that using cloth is just fine if they did it right. There were groups of girls who got together and spoke to the school authorities and asked them to renovate their toilets. 
All of this happened without my consciously planning for any of it. As my work got noticed, I started getting contacted by organizations who wanted me to work with them on menstrual hygiene management projects, which typically meant getting donors to distribute sanitary napkins, putting together manufacturing units for decentralized sanitary napkin production, and occasionally construction of toilets. That is the first time I started doubting what I intuitively knew were the issues around menstruation and instead started working with others on addressing the symptoms. It failed. Many of the girls felt that they were being forced to use sanitary napkins because they naturally preferred cloth. There were mothers who thought that we were selling them some cheap product and trying to make money out of it. The toilets we built were not being used, and if used, were maintained poorly. And just when I thought that maybe I was right after all, someone would throw at me very compelling statistics. 23% adolescent girls drop out of school once they hit puberty. And this was cited as a reason and a justification for all those projects. Did you know that actually the number of boys who drop out of school is more than the number of girls when it comes to government schools? According to a Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan survey of 2008, it was found that the incidence of school leaving among girls was 1.6 percentage points less than that of boys. And as far as attendance is concerned, it was found to be the same for both boys and girls. And in some states like Kerala and Uttarakhand reporting that the number of girls who were present at any point in time was five percentage points more than that of boys. So much for absenteeism owing to menstruation. So then why do some girls drop out of school? Most often, the reason is early marriage. In places like Chamrajnagar, where incidents of teenage pregnancies are high, mothers used to get their daughters married early, soon after they hit puberty. And then in places like Gulbarga, where dowry was very prevalent, parents would get their girls married at a very young age, which basically meant little or no dowry. So you see, regardless of all the sanitary napkins we actually distribute, it would not bring the girl child back to school. Besides, telling someone what to use and what not to use is not something we have the right to decide. It is only when we operate from our core that we hit the problem at its core. It's only then that we stop thinking of what we need to do for others and what we do automatically fits into the larger picture of what is needed for the issue. We place ourselves in the equation and there is no separation between them and I. I wondered why these projects were started. Projects that limited themselves to either distribution of sanitary napkins or construction of toilets with little or no interaction with the girls about the issue itself. I realize now that it is because of the way we perceive menstruation as a problem. Even the advertisements and the messages they convey are often about how best you can forget that you even have your period. If we continue to look at menstruation as a problem, the day would not be far when we would look at completely eliminating this problem. It is already happening. Even in the smallest villages, I have come across young girls who buy pills without, prescri without prescription to postpone their period. And the reason could be a travel, a class test, a drawing competition, or simply because they do not want to experience what it is to menstruate. Why is it that we have failed to appreciate the beauty in menstruation? Nature has the tendency to bestow upon us gifts which are covered in several layers. Unless we unravel these layers and look within, we cannot experience this gift. In the early ages, menstruation was considered as a sacred process and women who menstruate were thought to have magical powers. Men often relied upon the wisdom of menstruating women and the intuitive messages they shared to guide them in the day-to-day -day course of hunting and migrating. 
The menstrual cycle itself was considered to have its own significance, with each week in the cycle apparently being different. The first week that began with menstruation and bleeding was considered a period of cleansing and removal of all negative thoughts. This was when most women feel the need to be silent, go inward and be contemplative. The second week, which is called the pre-ovulation week, is the time when most women feel at their energetic best. This was considered ideal to kick off new projects or creative work. The third week, what we call the ovulation phase, was thought of as the time when most women look and feel more attractive. This was the time when they felt both vulnerable and the need to connect with others. The fourth week, the pre-menstruation week, is when we experience a rush of emotions and thoughts that do not occur to us during other times. What we today dismiss as PMS and mood swings was back then considered a highly intuitive phase and the messages that came to us during this time were taken very seriously. Women, they thought, had all four seasons within their body. I became conscious very recently of how everything that is feminine in a woman is symbolized in menstruation and the events around it. Every time we feel the aches and pains, does it not force us to slow down and become gentle? Every time we feel the surge of emotion just before a period, does it not remind us of how beautifully vulnerable we can be? Every time we stain a skirt during a period, does it not naturally make us sensitive towards others' feelings? And every time we bleed, aren't we reminded of our ability to create life? Menstruation is not a process to be tolerated, but a gift to be grateful for. Silencing the beauty of menstruation is silencing everything on earth that is feminine. Thank you.